Right, good morning and welcome. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. I'm Director of the Institute for Government. And we're delighted to have here this morning, <coughs> excuse me, coughing, winter cough, um, John Thompson, Chief Executive of HMRC and Head of the Operational Delivery Profession. And we've been working on this work about the functions, the specialisms within Whitehall with Oracle. We're delighted to be doing that with them and have been doing that really for some time now. It's work that's very important to the Institute and has been almost uh, since the start of the Institute nearly 10 years ago, in fact, our advance warning for our anniversary next year. And our thrust right through this has been the importance of building up specialist capability within the civil service and uh, enabling people to have a career within those specialisms, within those functions, whether it's finance or commercial or operational delivery. And we uh, have been work working on that uh, as I said, right from the start of the Institute, but put out a big report last summer on that and have more work coming out within our Whitehall Monitor team. Uh, that's the annual report we put out in, in the uh, start of the year within our Brexit team and its work currently headed by Benoit Guerin. Thanks very much indeed for that. Well, um, before John actually gets to kick off and he's going to be very, very kindly going to give a, a, a keynote speech about this, I'm going to hand over to Nick Jackson from Oracle to say a few words. Nick. So it's with pleasure that uh, I welcome you here on behalf of Oracle um, to what is the first in a small series we're doing with, uh, with the Institute around the whole professionalism agenda. Obviously today is around operational delivery and we're doing further sessions in the next couple of months around finance and HR. Um, clearly as a major provider of technologies that support government's delivery programme, we think it's really important that we support this agenda. Um, and some recent highlights I'd like to make notes of are last year's publication which on professionalising Whitehall and the subsequent keynote speech earlier this year with um, John Manzoni highlighting uh, the importance of, of, the, of, of Whitehall and the civil service getting to grips with, with this professionalism agenda. Um, clearly new technologies are facilitating step changes in the ways that services can be delivered. Uh, but it's always the challenge of, of people, the challenge of adoption and adaptation and how you make best use of those technologies that I think is, is increasingly coming to, to, uh, to the fore. Um, public services delivery obviously will continue to uh, face the challenges of financial constraints, of uh, increasing customer-consumer expectation, but also an expectation from the workforce around flexibility and access to modern environment and modern working tools. This places an onus on the professions to provide an environment that supports continuous adaptation and that takes advantage of the new technology as it continues to evolve at a pace that has never happened before. It is a personal pleasure, though, that I get to introduce John. Um, I had the pleasure of supporting John when he was head of the government finance profession between 2009 and 2011. Um, and I'm sure that he will bring similar candour, rigour, an insight to his leadership of the operational delivery profession. For those who are not aware, um, John took on his current role as CEO at uh, HMRC back in April 2016, um, having previously headed up uh, the Ministry of Defence as Permanent Secretary, from which position he was, he was pre prior to that uh, Director General for Finance. John's professional background is very much rooted in finance, as is my own, so we have some, some commonality there. Um, initially working in the private sector, local government, and then joining Ofsted, as we were just talking about, as uh, the pilot from uh, his predecessor as the head of government finance uh, back in 2004, joining Ofsted as the finance director as part of professionalising that profession um, and ensuring more finance directors had, the, had requisite qualifications. Um, John then joined what was then DCSF, now DFE, um, and then joined MOD, uh, and the rest is history. But John is clearly very much at the heart of Brexit, particularly in relation to the changes required at the borders, and particularly in terms of the challenges that Whitehall is facing uh, in terms of whatever the outcome uh, of the negotiations may, may transpire to be. I suspect, in fact I know, because I've just spoken to him about it, he's relishing the tackling that complexity uh, and uncertainty. With regard to his leadership of operational delivery, he will have, of course, the benefit of HMRC's experience particularly in relation to implementing smarter working uh, and its consolidation and rationalisation of its estate. 
Finally, and not to embarrass John too much, uh, I am reminded that last year, uh, when Amos Morse was supporting the launch of the Institute's uh, research into professionalising Whitehall, uh, the first question that Amos was asked uh, was about role models of leadership within uh, the civil service. And yes, John, it was you. So I am very much looking <laughs> wow. forward to what John is proposing for the operational delivery profession. John. Nick, thank you. You've taken, you've taken his speech. So rather brilliantly, Nick's gone off on my speech. <laughs> Well, look, first of all, can I say thank you very much for inviting me and thanks for coming. Um, it's great to see you all. When uh, Andrew Rhodes announced that he was joining Swansea U University, Sir Jeremy Hayward, John Manzoni and I got into a conversation about the fundamental importance of the operational delivery function to the government's public services uh, agenda. And that, those conversations fairly uh, swiftly turned into, wasn't that this the time really for operational delivery to be led by a permanent secretary? And we were aspiring to follow the excellent lead of Sir Chris Wormold, who has led the policy profession for some time now. I was very pleased to take up that challenge. And, and in about 10 minutes, I'm just going to cover uh, three things which I think are critical. First of all, the importance of operational uh, delivery to high quality public services. I'm then going to turn to the question of our professional offer to our people working in this profession, and then finally the connectivity of operational delivery to several other professional groups that we're going to try and cover. And then I think uh, Bronwyn's going to do some open Q&A and we're going to see where you want to go with that. So let me start with a few facts. Operational delivery was, as a profession was created in 2012, led for most of the period from then to now by Ruth Owen, a Director General in HMRC. About two-thirds of all civil servants, uh, or around a quarter of a million people, work in operational delivery across 20 departments. To give you some flavour of the work uh, which is undertaken, uh, colleagues pay state pension to more than 12 million people, pay child benefits to over 7 million families, issued yeah, last year nearly 7 million passports to uh, UK residents, manned the border at 40 airports and 120 ports and collected 600 billion pounds worth of taxes vital for the funding of public services. Actually, I could have extended that list uh, at quite some, uh, quite some scale. But the point of, of saying that is to just get across the fact that there is significant scale and scope of operational delivery in government. Quite often, civil servants in operational delivery are the face of government. They interact with citizens and businesses at emotionally challenging times, at transitions in people's lives. And this, I think, is a really important aspect of operational delivery. How exactly can you relate to the customer, which indeed is a word that some of you might uh, find is slightly odd. It's certainly in HMRC to say that taxpayers are customers does not necessarily sit comfortably with all of our colleagues, but I think it is important that we recognise that citizens and businesses are customers of public services. I recently tried to compare our customer services organisation with that of some of the uh, major companies in the UK and discovered that HMRC has relationships with ten times more businesses than British Gas and five times more citizens than Sky TV. So when you sort of think, oh, those are big businesses, then you might want to translate that into thinking, well, hang on a minute, the DWP and HMRC, the Home Office, the MOJ and so on are organisations of considerable scale. However you want to compare and contrast what we do, the point I'm making is this is big, complicated scale business. And it is, of course, in the full glare of the media. You've seen many, many stories about what works and sometimes uh, what doesn't. Let me hammer home one more point. Hard work and civil servants up and down this great country of ours deliver those public services every day sometimes in difficult and challenging circumstances, and I think they do it really rather well. As head of profession, I'm focusing on five key areas. Firstly, careers, and how we create a pathway for our colleagues who want a career in operational delivery as far as they want to take it. Secondly, leadership, how we develop the specific leadership skills that are required for operational delivery. Thirdly, how we attract and retain the necessary people into our profession. Fourthly, diversity, because uh, 
We aspire to the UK civil service being one of the most diverse and inclusive employers in the United Kingdom and operational delivery has a <coughs> fundamental role to play there. And lastly, reward. How do we reward our people? Because they deserve to be rewarded for what they do. In learning and qualifications, you might be surprised to know that we offer six different qualifications from GCSE through to master's degrees now. And we do that through a very modern blended learning approach, a heavy emphasis on digital learning that fits around what you're doing in operational uh, delivery so you can fit that around your professional life. Since we launched those qualifications, more than 22,000 people have registered and nearly 10,000 have now completed their qualification. In apprenticeships, we have a massive contribution to make. Nearly 6,000 apprentices are working in operational delivery. 99% of those have, uh, have graduated. Uh, many of them have graduated with a distinction yellow card for, uh, for Charles. Uh, for, for me personally, Roy, apprenticeships as great personal uh, residence. Residents. If you don't know anything about me, I am a former apprentice. I left school at 18, became an apprentice. I had uh, come from a working class background. I will always be grateful for the fantastic start that my first employer gave me with that apprenticeship. It enabled me to build my confidence, working four days a week and studying on the fifth day in the blended approach of the learning supporting my work and the other way around, I think was a fantastic start to my career. The potential difference that we can make in operational delivery to building people's skills and to the diversity of the civil service is absolutely huge. We're trying to give people the opportunity to develop themselves if they want to, to be a better person and contribute more. I think this is hugely important for us as a profession and it's vitally important to me. On the question of leadership, um, I recently gathered together the Director Generals will lead operational delivery functions. The first time that actually, interestingly, the first time that actually um, happened. And we talked about what's the future of this profession and what do we really aspire to. And one of the strongest views that was expressed was the desire to develop a differentiated leadership offer. I mean, the civil service has some of the best leadership and development schemes that you're ever going to experience. I know that from having been through three of them. Uh, myself, but as we've seen from the, the excellent leadership of Tony Meggs at the Infrastructure and Projects Authority, the development of a profession-specific leadership offer, I think, has made a massive difference. The Major Projects of Leadership Academy has demonstrated that specific learning in a profession, uh, in the leadership of a profession, really has great value. So we've decided to explore that. What is it that we might uh, develop? To give you some sense of the two uh, dimensions that we think need to be explored here uh, and uh, to bring it to life perhaps. In HMRC, directors leading operational delivery quite often have thousands of colleagues working for them. In HMRC, the largest directorate has 11,000 people working for them. I mean, that's bigger than some government departments. Leading thousands of people is commonplace um, in operational delivery and inspiring and engaging and encouraging thousands of people whilst at the same time uh, meeting demanding targets in the full glare of the media is a specific skill and it, it requires specific techniques. And we decided to look at, well, what is it, therefore, that we might specifically offer to leaders in operational delivery? But even that, it seems to me, might be rather narrow. When I took on this role, um, uh, Nick is right, I had been the head of the finance profession for three years up to 2011, but there'd been a gap between that and taking up this profession. So I sat down with the heads of four professions, all of which I thought were more mature than where we were. And one of those was Sir Chris Wormald as head of the policy profession. You know, where was he taking the policy profession and, and what was he doing? And we quickly got into a conversation about how the two professions worked uh, together. For both of us, we wondered whether there was enough understanding on both sides uh, between policy and operational delivery. And the, the, the initial decision that we've taken is uh, that from this point on, all fast stream entrants to the civil service will have at least one placement in operational delivery so that they get great experience in policy in and around Whitehall, but they also see what public service delivery is like um, on the other side of that equation. We, we think that we need to expose people to both aspects of, of that relationship. But we know we also need to go quite a bit further in operational uh, delivery and this led me to wondering where else OD, Opdel needed to have relationships with other professions and what we needed to 
uh, appreciate about the skills and contributions uh, made by others. It seems to me there's plenty of potential for leaders to learn both ways in a number of related disciplines, those of transformation, digital technology, projects and communications. And let me just try to illustrate that with an HMRC example. Some of you might know that in Spending Review 2015, HMRC was very successful in securing significant funds from the Treasury to transform the tax system. 1.8 billion pounds uh, spread over four years. And in the last three years, we've learned a lot about what works um, and we've learned something about what doesn't uh, work. I mean, the launch of new digital services for taxpayers like the personal tax account has been taken up at enormous scale and it was launched in the late spring of 2016. Last week, we had our 17 millionth uh, registered personal tax account from citizens in the UK. It's now working with us digitally is now much more popular uh, than actually working in an analogue dimension. Phone calls are down by 17%. The number of forms that we issued in 2015, and I can hardly believe I'm going to say this, was 330 million in 2015. Can you believe that? Uh, this year it'll be down at 30 million and obviously we're aspiring to get that down to zero. I mean, that is a dramatic decrease in uh, old sort of analogue ways of working. To deliver those sorts of changes has required a team approach from considering policy changes to the creation of delivery of projects, from process re-engineering to changing technical architecture, from new digital services to changing the customer support model, and striving to communicate all of that to customers and trying to maybe get some behavioural change with customers whilst getting their feedback about, is this actually what you want in terms of uh, customer services? To deliver, to deliver what we've achieved so far has required leaders to appreciate each other and the skills and contribution that they can make. And we have some fantastic and impressive results so far. More tax revenue received, higher overall trust, in HMRC as an institution and lower running costs. Already, for that £1.8 billion investment, the Treasury is up by £1.1 billion a year. Now, that's a, a deal that I think most private sector people would do. If you gave me £1.8 billion, I'd say I'd give you back £1.1 billion a year. Uh, at this point, private sector chairman all go, yeah, great. I mean, that's the really kind of thing that we're doing. But we are fundamentally trying to transform the way in which the tax system works and customers interact with us. But we have to also recognise that there are lessons to be learned. Some of our original assumptions haven't quite been right. Maybe the policy wasn't quite right. The design was a bit too quick. Some of those digital tools came out a bit too fast. Maybe they weren't tested quite as long as you'd want to. Customers haven't necessarily understood what we were aspiring for. We've had great and rich feedback from customers about what works. We have customer satisfaction now just over 83% with uh, what we're doing. But they fed back their dissatisfaction, and rightly they should. And of course, events, dear, dear boy, get in the way. And maybe you might want to talk about what those events might be when we come to Q&A. Uh, look, don't get me wrong. I mean, overall, I think HMRC's come a long way in three years. But we have to reflect on what's worked and what ha hasn't worked. But improving understanding between professional groups, I think, is among those lessons. So we're looking to develop an offer for leaders that's about leading large numbers of people, but also how you, as a leader, relate to other leaders and other professions, how you collaborate and work with them for the overall good of your organisation. So let me conclude by saying this. Operational delivery is absolutely vital for the government's public services delivery agenda. The profession is full of hard-working, dedicated, loyal <coughs> civil servants, generally delivering really rather well. Our professional offer to them is clear, it's taken up at enormous scale, but we need to continue to reflect on how we could do better, how we could improve, and we need to work together with others. I'm interested in what you think and what you want to ask me. Thanks very much. John, brilliant. Thank you very much. You've taken across, uh, us across a huge um, range of things. Let me start right at the beginning and um, ask you to tell us how operational delivery can be a, a sort of coherent profession if there's 230,000 people in it. And as, as, as you said, it's, it's more than two-thirds of the, of the civil service and it's got all, people doing all kinds of things within it. Well, how does it feel like a, a profession? Does it feel like a profession? I'm, I'm, well, I think there's, there's quite a bit of work to be done about whether it is a cohesive profession in that sense. I mean, if you think about what are some of the um, private sector comparators, the easiest one is to talk about the Institute of Customer Service Management. Yeah. 
Um, but that doesn't really fit with running a prison, does it? Right? I mean, yeah. running a prison is, is, you know, is that really about customer services delivery? So we, feel, we felt customer service is a bit narrow. I mean, what operational delivery is about is delivering large scale public services across a range of, of, of different areas. But so that does include, you know, prisons and courts as well as what you might traditionally think of as being customer services, you know, ring up or you process a form or you interact in a digital way. So at the minute, does it feel like a cohesive uh, profession? No, I don't think it, it does. There's some considerable work, I think, with the 250,000 people about yeah. promoting the profession, getting recognition for the profession. And, you know, this, this is one of those, this is a, a fantastic opportunity for me to say, you know, this is where I'm trying to get to and this is how important you are. Um, but there's quite a lot of work to be done, I think, about recognising that it is a single profession and how mm. you can transport mm. from one organisation. I mean, would to all the another. people in it actually say that they were part of it? Do you think? No, uh, I don't. Or they I, say I'm in prisons, or I'm in HMRC, or I, I don't think they would. I mean, you know, even in my own organisation, some people would say they work in customer services, and some they work in mm. customer compliance. And you know, I mean, the, those are the two big wings of HMRC. You know, never mind about I do you feel yourself as being operational delivery. So there's, you know, there's a long mm. there's a long journey ahead of us, but. I'm totally recognising that. In six years, I think I think my predecessors have, have done a lot. They've built up the capacity and capability of it. But at this point, it the profession needs a, it needs a champion and a cheerleader. It needs someone who can say, you are doing a fantastic job, and here's the offer, and let's try to get a more cohesive picture about what works for you yeah. and what doesn't, and how do we involve you, and how do we co-create with you the future of this profession. And I, I'm, I'm very, very keen to get people's views I mean, 22,000 people taking qualifications is a lot, but it's less than 10% of the number of people who are in it. <laughs> so it's both an impressive and, and perhaps not an impressive, impressive number. So I think there's a lot more to do. To do. One of the reasons why I sat down with the four more mature uh, organized, uh, professions was to say, well, you know, have you got this far? What have you done? And then can we copy some of that? And I set up some of it in the... Mm. in the speech. No, there's, there's a long way to go. Mm. So you pick one of them, uh, policy, and you talked about Chris, Chris Wormald, head, mm. head of the policy profession. How, how do you work with a policy profession? Because we hear an awful lot anecdotally, which can easily be, be you know, caricature, but about the gulf between policy and delivery. And how, how, how do you want your people to work with his people? So, so policy doesn't mean anything unless you can deliver it. I mean, it's sort of pretty obvious. Indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, ministers uh, both want some success from launching a policy, but they do actually want it to be delivered as well, mm -hmm. don't they? So you, you, you do need to understand where I think, if, you, if I was a minister, which I'm obviously not, if I was standing up and saying, I'm launching this great initiative, I want to have some, some assurance that it could actually be go out and you could actually deliver it, right? And therefore, the, connectiv the direct connectivity of those two professions understanding each other um, and then being able to give ministers clarity about, okay, we understand what you want to achieve in policy terms, but you're going to have to be able to, you know, here's how we think you can deliver this and here's what the timescales are and this is what it's going to cost you and here's the cost-benefit analysis of that and this is what it means in digital and technology terms and so on. It, it is an ongoing debate. I think it's reasonably well seeded uh, across Whitehall, but I still think that there are further areas where we need to go. I mean, ministers aspire to get some things done perhaps quicker than we all feel yeah. comfortable about. And s some of that sort of conversation with ministers about, yeah, I, I know you want to be able to do it in April, but you know, it requires two years worth of technology development for it to be safe to be launched. You know, that's when you need the operational delivery person yeah. or a technology yeah. person or a digital person to come in the room and say, we understand what you're trying to achieve, but this is reasonable about what's this project going how long is this project going to take and what does it mean? Yeah. All of that, of course, is, is hidden from ministers. I mean, ministers don't need to understand the technical architecture of HMRC. I mean, I barely yeah. understand it myself, right? But yeah. we do need to be able to get across to ministers. This is about delivery time scale. Yeah. I mean, I think the development of the HMRC, uh, HM Treasury Policy Partnership, which is formally called that, is a really fantastic development <coughs> um, in Whitehall in that all advice to the Chancellor of the Exchequer and Treasury Ministers goes with both sides of the House, as it were, yeah. commenting not only on the policy but also on the deliverability of what it is that Ministers yeah. want, so that when the Chancellor stands up and says, I'm introducing this new tax, 
you know, let's say he does, let's say hypothetically speaking, he does that in two weeks' time, that he says he's going to introduce a new tax, and on day X, we've got a, you know, a, a, every reasonable prospect that can be delivered on the operational mm. delivery side of it. I think it's really, really mm. uh, important. Do you think prime ministers need delivery units? Power to their elbow. I, I thought the, I, I, I thought the, I thought the delivery unit was rather good. I mean, I thought I thought both, both Michael and then Ray mm. actually did. Uh, did bring a lot to the delivery of public services because you know in the end what you pay for uh, as a taxpayer is is to is the delay for public services you I mean you know that it's a sort of deal isn't it yeah. right that you're gonna you're gonna get highways or your bins emptied yeah. or, or whatever um and therefore it's it is a deal people important. you know people voters you know think it's a deal yeah yeah, yeah and i think some of the difficulty yeah. about about local government then is you know because you you pay you pay a council tax but what you see as a re receivable back the other way is it yeah. doesn't it doesn't necessarily feel like you get your you get value for money from the street lights and the, the highways and the bins if that's all you think that you're getting back for your council tax but but in general, the point about... Uh, and you, you don't know. see the social care that, in fact, some of your local yeah. spending is going on. as an advance plug for our performance tracker tomorrow morning. I think, yeah. I think, I think tracking performance... Uh, I mean, Nick, mm. Nick knows this. I'm completely and utterly obsessed by management information. Right? Mm. I need to know exactly what's going on in my organisation. The, the, the value of MI uh, being surfaced to someone like me mm. that says, OK, I've got three strategic objectives. I've got, I've got 12 big targets that are set by ministers, but actually what that requires is a system that can tell me what's actually going on. So you can say, this is going well, but I need to intervene here and remove those barriers. That, you can only get that by having a regular flow of high quality management information. That's really, really fundamental to operational delivery. Yeah. Let's go back to the, the offer that you said you're, you're making to people in operational delivery. Is it plausible to say to someone, uh, look, you can join in that, uh, possibly as an apprentice, and make your way up to the top of a Whitehall department? Is it plausible? Mm. But yeah, well, it's got to be plausible. Look, I mean, I, I know it's a long time ago, but <laughs> in 1983, I left school with mm. three A-levels. You know, nobody, in, nobody I knew mm. ever went to university mm. from the school that I came from. Mm. You know, it's been opened mm. and closed three times mm. and academised and goodness mm. knows that. You know, it's just a bit, it was a difficult place. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, I became an apprentice. Yeah. I started at what is the equivalent of uh, administrative officer, yeah. and now I'm a permanent secretary. Yeah. Now I know I've yeah. had a career in and out yeah. of the civil yeah. service, but yeah. it is, it's possible. There are a lot yeah. of people who make it quite a long way up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've got two DGs who yeah. started at that sort of level and are made director general. Yeah. Yeah. It's perfectly possible. I mean, I, I, I asked you that because it's I mean, very much what we, when I mean, John Manzoni here earlier in the year was was talking about, it, trying to, you know, make it possible for people to rise, you know, right to the top within a within a function, um, and um, and not have to move around. So it's a point both about you know uh, generalism, but also about. Um, I guess what we were just talking about a moment ago, the you know, gulf that's sometimes there between policy and delivery. So, no, I mean, your experience and, and what you say uh, is, is, is really important on that. Um, let, me, let me turn to one of the, I mean, the event that you didn't um, uh, name directly, but uh, Brexit, and um, which you have given evidence, I think you said, to eight select committees so far, and more to come. Um, <laughs> what is what is what, what is, you want to know? <laughs> yeah, what has that done to um, first first to the kind of demands on Whitehall and uh, and on HMRC if that's the, the, so the bit so, that so it's an extraordinary want to start with. it's an extraordinary period in our in our careers. I mean, I don't know whether any of us will ever experience anything like this again. Mm. I mean, you know, we, the the mandate was clear. The government's been clear about what it's trying to do. But you've got everything you could ever want to try and do at an enormous scale in quite a compressed period of time. So you've got the policy formulation and a negotiation that, mm. are, are clearly in, that are clearly interlinked. And then where you are with policy then needs to translate into, what does that mean in terms of projects and tech and uh, operational delivery and what does that mean about finances and what does it mean about the, your staffing model and so on. You know, just about everything, everything in your organisation changes. So for us, Ultimately, we'll peak out uh, at somewhere around 5,000 extra staff under various different scenarios. I mean, on a base of 58,000, that's quite a significant yeah. change. Yeah. And, and pretty much your entire policy landscape about what you're trying to do, say, in customs, may also have significantly yeah. changed. So what you're trying to do... So you sort of came policy. down a lot, and now they've gone up a lot. 
Yeah, sorry, no, you're talking no, about. I, I mean, HMRC, see, HMRC's yeah. spending review in 2015 was a was a gentle yeah. decline. I mean, it, yeah. because actually the core the core model of HMRC is to have less customer services because people self serve. Yeah. But you then div you then take those resources and put them into customer compliance. So basically, we're opening more tax inquiries. Just so you know, uh, <laughs> about seven hundred thousand a year, and that number continues to rise because. Frankly, there's still quite a margin between where we are and, the, and what we might be able to collect in tax. So that was a core case in, in, in 2015, and now you've added on top of this. So we are now rising. Yeah, we'll go back. We'll go back past where we were in 2015 by s several thousand. Yeah. I mean, at, at the, we anticipated getting to 2020 with 48,000, and I suspect we will now be somewhere closer to 60,000 by the time we get to 2020. Some of that is about Brexit, but some of it is also there have been various fiscal events in which the Chancellor of the Exchequer has said, well, hang on a minute, we, could, we, we need to focus more on avoidance and evasion. If I give you more people, will I get more revenue? And the answer to that is yes. And if you give me more people, I can get you more revenue. Um, and so there's been significant investment both by George Osborne and, and Philip Hammond, in, but it changes the balance of the organisation, right? So that's your core case. But then Brexit could have, I mean, uh, there are options in Brexit that could have significant operational impact not only on HMRC but also on, on UK industry. You know, that's not yeah. the government's preferred option. The government's preferred option is to strike, yeah. strike the long-term economic deal. But um, under no deal, uh, the number of people we have processing customs declarations would rise from 700 to 2,500, something like that, to give you some sense about the, yeah. the magnitude of, of the difference. So yeah, Brexit, yeah. it's a big thing. We're never going to live, we're never going to yeah. live through a time like this again. Yeah. What's your response to the, you know, now our inescapable question of whether Whitehall is ready for Brexit, uh, if there is a deal, and then if there isn't? So look, I mean, uh, some of you might have noticed me on the BBC uh, saying stuff about this. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to be inconsistent. I've, I've given evidence to eight select committees and I've got another three in the next month. Uh, just to just to round yeah. it off, <laughs> and, uh, whether there's a deal, which we all think really really hope for, or there's not a deal, to fully optimise and change the custom system, for example, takes <coughs> takes three years, and it's primarily not about the civil service, right? It's primarily about what does it mean in the private sector in terms of logistics. Um, and transportation and manufacturing. So I went to a major car manufacturer uh, the other day and said, you know, what what difference does Brexit would Brexit make for you if there was if there was no deal? So setting setting aside the fact that that's that's not the plan, right? So I need to continue to emphasise that. They were very very open with us about well, you you might have tariffs, but the the real concern was about also about the the friction in terms of transportation and just in time logistics uh, where. You know, for, for anyone who understands manufacturing, people don't have warehouses anymore. They're warehouses on a lorry, somewhere between where the, the part is made and the factory, right? And it, and that's the very Good nature of it. it. And uh, and you know, uh, in, this, in this particular case, the lorry has to turn up in a one-hour window, and then it comes straight. I mean, I was standing there, and they took it off the lorry and put it straight on the production line, and then straight onto the car, right? I mean, it's just an incredible system. It's incredibly optimised. And if what we now do is to put some friction into that system by saying you have to have a 10 minute check, say, for the purposes of WTO rules, then, then you can fairly easily extrapolate from that. So, so I'm not going to be inconsistent in that. I've given all that evidence in public uh, before. Three years to optimise. That's the consistent advice that we get from talking to anyone you want to talk to about. Now, does that mean that you can still function in April 2019? Yes, you can still function mm. in April 2019, but it wouldn't be optimal. Yeah. Yeah. So I've chosen to use the uh, fantastic <coughs> civil service language here and say it'll be sub-optimal. Sub That's about as far as my civil service colleagues will get me to be a civil servant. Right? Thank you, but you have answered the question, and thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for that. Let's go back to your point about tax, which I, I, is intriguing, and whether you, you said, give, give me more people, I can get you more tax. We spend quite a bit of time here discussing one of the difficult things in running a, a, a modern democracy is how to collect tax and governments you know got all the levers it used to have except in some might argue they're less effective <coughs> you know companies or people are much more mobile and uh, and so on 
And um, what, what, is, what is your response to this? Is it a question of, of numbers? Is it a question of improved management? Can, do, you, do you think there are ways of government running itself, running uh, you know, um, a function like HMRC in order to be able to raise more tax, which any, this isn't a political point, I mean, it, any government needs to be able to collect tax. So, so the, the straightforward answer to your question is yes, but uh, it's, it's probably <laughs> not worth just stopping at the yes. <laughs> so, uh, so we have the lowest tax gap in the world. So that's the difference yeah. between the amount we do collect and the amount that's theoretically the maximum yeah. amount that you can collect. And we publish all of that. We do an, an extensive annual report of what's this, this thing called a tax gap. We have the lowest one in the world. We are the only country in the world that produces this document that says we did collect 606, but we... we we technically didn't collect 36. And we give reasons why we didn't, because some of it's hidden and some of it's criminality and so on and so forth. But in there somewhere is also avoidance and evasion. But there is also quite a big theme about just errors. That people, that the system is quite complex. Yeah. And it's, uh, if you're running a, you know, a, a small, medium-sized enterprise, then, and you're not using an agent, then, you know, it's, uh, an error, it's relatively straightforward to make an error. <coughs> And we aren't necessarily facilitating that. Sorry, we aren't necessarily helping you to get it right. So the, one of the drives was for making tax digital for business, yeah. which was yeah. the, produc the production, the market production of products that businesses could use that would help them to get their tax right and then automatically fill in the return and give us the return. Yeah. Um, you would not believe this, but one of the pieces of evidence that supported that was that transposition errors alone on the VAT return was worth 600 million pounds in additional revenue, right? Of course, all those transposition errors were in favor of the customer, right? Now you, might, you might wonder about that, but let's, you know, they were all transposition errors, so that, you know, so that the introduction of that, at this point for VAT, above the VAT threshold, is a step into, we can, we think we can put intermediation between businesses and us that will help you to get it right, help you to run your business more effectively, but also we improve the amount of tax that we collect. So we've thought quite a long and hard about other things. So a good example of this is um, what's called inter intermediation. So uh, how many people have got a smartphone? I mean, I guess you've all got a smartphone and you've all got apps on your smartphone and you probably order a taxi or you order a meal or you book a flight or something. Mm -hmm. right? I, sorry, I can't say the names of the apps because uh, that wouldn't be right. And you pay them, and then it actually they're just an agent for another organisation. Mm. And what happens is you think you're paying the, the name of the brand and the app. You're not. You're actually paying the other party. And what we discovered was that this flow of money from you through your app, probably paid through PayPal, that goes to the third party, is quite often lost in mm. people's tax returns. And so we sort of sit there and ponder about, well, hang on a minute, is that right? Mm. Mm. And uh, came up with the idea of so-called withholding. So could you say, for example, that the, that the intermediary between you and the actual service provider ought to take 20% off the top and, mm. and pay your tax for you? Now, that would mean that we'd add the cash, which obviously would be quite nice. Yeah. But it also would put, re reduce the potential for fraud and error in the other pie. Yeah. If you want me to bring that to life with an actual story, I could. But, yeah. you know, it's just... Th so we're yeah. beginning to think about... Rather interestingly, we might need a larger customer services organisation, yeah. which helps customers to get it right more, yeah. builds up the level of trust between customers and HMRC as an institution, so you get less errors that need to be investigated yeah. through a tax... Yeah. Uh, inquiries and that conceptualization of it will be a big theme of spending review 19 for HMRC. Thank you. Let's take some questions because I think they're going to be quite a few. <laughs> uh, right, first, first off, right there. Somebody going to want to write on your Good morning. Uh, it's Chris Morris from the BBC. Um, I'm sure you'll be astonished, but I'd like to ask you something else about Brexit if I may. Um, you're often quoted by those who say the Irish border question is, is massively exaggerated. Uh, it's a quote, I think, from a select committee, I think it was late last year, and you said, we do not believe we require any infrastructure at the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland under any circumstances. Correct. For clarity, is the we in that sentence, we the HMRC, or we the authorities on both sides of the border? And is the infrastructure talking about just customs infrastructure or HMRC infrastructure? Or did you also mean, as, as some seek to imply, 
infrastructure for regulatory checks and for SPS checks as well. Second question, uh, you mentioned the 5,000 you ultimately think you may need to yep. uh, recruit as a result of Brexit. Can you say how many have been roughly have been recruited thus far? Sure. And what are they doing? Um, I mean, are they primarily planning people or if you did need physically more people inspecting the customs inspectors at border yep. post next April, have you got yep. them ready to roll? Okay. Thanks. So the we in that was uh, we HMRC uh, do not believe that you require any infrastructure at the Northern Irish uh, Ireland border for the purposes of, of customs. It's set out actually in a paper that the government uh, published <coughs> in the summer of 2017. And the reason that we don't believe that is because um, what happens at the actual physical border does not necessarily have to be connected to the collection of tax. In fact, in the UK, if you're importing from the rest of the world, uh, you don't pay over the money when you actually get to the UK border. It's all through an administrative process. Um, actually, the National Customs Hub is in Salford, right? and you, it's all done electronically through declarations. So our proposition, which the government uh, clearly set out, was through administrative procedures, some derogation to uh, recognise the fact that the, the Northern Irish uh, economy is very, very integrated. I mean, you know, the, you, you can, you know, milkmen do literally cross the border in their rat and, and as the plumbers and, you know, all that. The, at the smaller end of that, it's a very integrated business. You, we, so the proposition was you derogate those outside the system. And for larger businesses, there would be an administrative procedure where they could administer customs away from the border, which is the situation for uh, trade between the UK and the rest of the world. In fact, for the EU and the rest of the world. So. That answers, I think, question number one. That continues to be our, our, our position, and because that's being uh, uh, negotiated. Uh, how many people do we have? So we're past 2,000 of the 5,000. Initially, that was all on policy. You have to remember that um, uh, customs became an EU-wide process in 1974. <coughs> Therefore, you know, we, we had to start with um, hiring a number of people to specialise in customs. That then spread out across a range of other policy areas, VAT. Uh, remember, HMRC is also um, part of the welfare state with tax credits and child benefits. So we're, we're involved in the free movement of people in the access to welfare debate. So it was initially in policy. That's then translated into a range of projects. We've got 11 um, projects running. Some of those are about technology. Um, so, it's, so there's policy, there's projects, there's now technology, and we are beginning to grow the number of people ready for um, operational delivery. We're in the fortunate position that, that uh, thousands of people want to join HMRC. There's actually a waiting list of 4,000 people to join HMRC. So if you, if you need people uh, relatively swiftly, you can ring them up and say, you passed the assessment process in July, we've now got a job and it's October, you know, are you still interested? So we can switch it on, but we are, we're well on towards the four to 5,000 that was quoted. Is that both of you? Yeah, it's on the back of front line, if you needed front line staff at, physically at border ah. in April. Have okay. You, have you got them? Have you recruited people? So HMRC hasn't had anyone at the actual physical border since 2007. Um, uh, the border force actually carries out that sort of work. Um, there are some HMRC facilities, which we don't talk about very much, which are called inland pre-clearance. So if we uh, don't like you very much, and uh, so I need to be careful there, um, and you ship a container in from somewhere in the rest of the world, uh, we, might, we might move it to a location that we have, and, which is not anywhere near the port, and then it's opened, and somebody will literally go through everything in that container because we know there are some organisations that like to commit uh, fraud and crime that way, and the easiest way to find out is to literally open it and literally go through it all. And I've been to that facility and done one of those things. It's the most incredible thing you're ever going to do. Um, and the 37 highest um, risk importers to the United Kingdom have stopped importing altogether because we do some of that activity, which is great in terms of fraud and reducing the tax gap and so on and so forth, but we don't run the border, it's, it's the border force. Thanks. There's one over here uh, by the door. 
Uh, Thomas Cole from the People's Vote campaign. Uh, you mentioned earlier in this year that the cost to business of the mass of the max fac option yep. would be twenty billion pounds. Yep. Looking at the the, the notion which has been uh, flying around the last couple of days, the idea that the UK as a whole would be in a in a customs union backstop with the EU and Northern Ireland would be in a separate regulatory zone, essentially part of the single market, and GB wouldn't. Have you been mapping the costs to business uh, on the, of that particular approach? And is there a figure at all that you'd be able to share with us? Thank you. So the answers to your question are, uh, are we have, I, I can't comment on the ongoing negotiations or, gi or give you any you know, hard numbers, sorry, to disappoint you. We are continuing to advise ministers on what are the administrative burdens of the options that they're discussing and, and negotiating. You're right that I did. I did say that the the cost of uh, it was 17 to 20 billion pounds a year. Um, I absolutely stand by that. Um, it's had a it's had a couple of uh, economists in a who are in favour of uh, Brexit have said no, I'm wrong. But I'm afraid I'm using the right data and the right assumptions, and they're not, with the greatest of professional respect. Um, I stand by the numbers that we gave at 17 to 20 billion. Um, it's made up of two things. First of all, in the event of no deal, you have to, and the assumption that you're outside the customs union, you have to assume you have to fill in customs declarations. 200, 200 million a year is the estimate for that, at roughly 32.15, so that's 6.5 billion. For every import, there's an export, so you have to double that number, that's 13 billion. Um, and then there's the question about um, what's the cost of either rules of origin or what might be the common external tariff. So this is the worst possible case that I was asked about it in select committees and I'll stand by the estimate of 17 um, to 20 billion. It's highly likely, given that I've got three more select committees in the next four weeks, that they'll ask me about it again. I, I can't tell you where we are with the actual negotiations and what that varies upon. Thanks. Over here, Julian McRae, Associate of the Institute and author of much of our previous work. Great. Thanks very much. And uh, now at uh, King's College London. Um, John, great to hear you talking about the profession. Great to see an operational delivery and a real recognition of that in the thinking of the civil service. Quite often it just drifts off. And listening to what you were talking about, it sounds like you, the approach you're taking is very similar to a lot of other functions have taken. Start with people, develop them, and really focus on that capability and capacity. Um, I was just wondering about the ambition that you were setting for this. That because quite often when functions have matured a little, they've started to think about, well, how do we sort out the really big problems that we know are going on continually? You mentioned Tony Meggs a couple of times. I mean, he talks about the valley of death, by which he means that there are great policy ideas which are produced, yeah. agreed to by ministers, and chucked across the valley of death to an operational side with delivery plans that really don't actually add up, not because they're undoable, but they're undoable with the capability we've currently got or the yeah. timescales you're attempting to do with them. Um, Two sort of questions. What would the... Wait, wait, is that a question? Yeah, this is a question. question. Is, is, question, is, that, is, that, is that a question? What, what about impossible plans? Or, what about or, impossible plans? But also, you yourself, would, if you spotted impossible plans as head of operational delivery profession, would you feel you had to intervene to do something about it, to get things back on track? Great. <laughs> valley uh, of death. The valley. So I, I know what Tony means by the valley of death, which is, you know, people have really great ideas. They have really great ideas. And then they sort of say, well, OK, you need to do this. And then you sort of work out the fact that they aren't really very really great ideas. And then somebody has to sort of work out how you do something else. That's, I, I think that's his sort of value. Would I say anything? Look, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly renowned for being a shrinking violet. So yeah, I would. I mean, one of the fantastic qualities of civil servants, I think, is, is to speak truth unto power. I mean, to go back to the question about what was it going to cost? I mean, that was a sort of moment, wasn't it? I mean, if somebody asked me that, it would have been easy to have navigated around that as a you know, a civil servant and given a bunch of words and not a number. I'm not really like that. I mean, the personal consequence for me has been very, very significant of doing that. I mean, I, um, you know, we've had to literally change h how I travel and what my personal security is. And, you know, we've had two death threats investigated by the Metropolitan Police for speaking truth unto power. About Brexit. About Brexit. Now that's those are real situations, right? And I, so I'm, I'm still not going to back away from it if I if I think something doesn't work. It, it's incumbent on me. Now we live in a democracy, right? So in the end, uh, it's for governments to decide, ministers to decide what it is they want to implement. But our our role as civil servants is to act with integrity and give them our best advice. And I think civil servants do 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 that. And I think we're we're really rather good at it. But in the end, it's a democracy. So you you give ministers your best advice. 
You may or may not agree. The minister makes that decision, and then you have to, and then that's government policy. You have to go and implement that as best you can. Great, thanks. Uh, sorry, a whole cluster. Uh, one there, and then uh, David Walker, Guardian in. Public. Just to follow that up, that's a highly personal answer. It doesn't need to be institutionalised. Roman asked you earlier about a delivery unit. Now there are two phases, aren't there? There's the pre-screening yep. of policy yep. in terms of its deliverability, uh, which. For major projects, an apparatus exists in the form of the Infrastructure yeah. and Project Authority. But for sort of revenue-heavy projects, thinking of universal credit, there is no such mechanism. A delivery unit, as existed under the Blair government, looked at delivery of specific targets. It didn't do this work of pre-screening to make sure that the work of the operational delivery profession was realised in terms of anticipating the operational difficulties of delivering a policy. So, you, so my earlier answer still stands. I mean, I was in favour of PMDE. I thought it was rather good and rather effective and, and brought some additional dimensions to it. Actually, um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't fall into the assumption that the major projects authority only looks at, at infrastructure and technology. It does also look at major and significant uh, policy changes. So the one that you quoted, Universal Credit, <coughs> almost certainly would have gone through um, some sort of higher-up approval, which involved... Um, the, uh, I can't remember what it's called, it's called the Major Projects Review Group that then, uh, I think, reports into the Chief Secretary and to one of the Cabinet Office Ministers so that, so that at that sort of scale, there is some independent scrutiny of it. It's then incumbent, right, if it's not going through some sort of corporate process, it's incumbent on permanent secretaries and their teams on the normal flow of policy going to ministers in a ministerial delegated uh, way to have a good grip on is this deliverable or not? They, it just does. So there's, there is a corporate system, and below that, it's down to departments. Now, I am to run a non-ministerial department, um, so we have created an investment committee. You've got a good policy idea. You have to put it up to the investment committee. You have to say, this is what it's going to cost. These are what the benefits are. And that's part of that flow towards ministers of, can it or can it uh, not be uh, delivered? I mean, it, so I think the system, I think the system's there. But it still requires the sort of intangible that Julian's looking at of, uh, you can have all the processes you want in the world, but people at various points have to do the intangible thing of, say, of saying, I, I really don't think this is going to necessarily work in the timescale you want it to work. Are you really sure? Yeah. I mean, Thank I, you. And I think civil servants do do that. But it's still a democracy. Thank you. Here, here on the aisle, second row. Oh, hi. I'm Laura Bouchard from Microsoft. I run our central government business. Um, I'm not going to ask about Brexit. I'm going to ask you a question about culture. Um, so how do you balance the urgency, John, of um, the urgency to transform um, the workforce with taking staff of all experience levels on that journey with you? So, so my theory here is um, you, you, have to involve, you have to involve people. So uh, that would be a good example. So, so I quite like... I'm quite taken by uh, a book called Servant Leadership by a fellow called Robert Greenleaf. It's quite old now, from the 1970s, which uh, sets out a number of different theories, one of which is that one of the purposes of senior leaders is to enable the rest of the organisation to be as, um, as productive as it possibly can, and you are serving them to be as productive as they can. And therefore, for me, I try to co-create and share as much as possible. So it's pretty apparent, to, to bring that to life, it's pretty apparent to me on my second visit out as chief exec to Coventry that everyone hated the, the performance management system. I mean, hated it. They really, really hated it, right? Um, and to give that, give that a bit of flavour, 25% of civil servants used to get a bonus, the sort of top 25% of people used to get a bonus. 76% of people hated it. Now, that included the people who were actually getting a bonus, right? I mean, that's a bit all about it. Anyway, people really, really hated it. So I sort of sat down and said, well, OK, well, what do you want to do then? And we involved 50,000 people in giving views about what was wrong with the system, how you might change the system. We ran 11 different, what arose from that was 11 different models. We tested those 11 different models with people. We involved them in workshops and so on. And then in the end, when we launched the new system, there was genuine ownership by colleagues of, oh, yeah, well, that's, we, had, we could say something about that. So we've done that through a series of people-related policies is to share what you're thinking of and test that and co-create with people. Now, in terms of, 
I can't rewind Spender Review 15, but certainly in relation to Spender Review 19, we've now begun that track too. So some of the ideas which are in our hopper for to put to the Chancellor in Spender Review 19 are now being socialised with some of our, our colleagues to say, oh, we're thinking about, to go back to that question about withholding, socialising that with people and saying, do you think that could work? How could, how could we improve that? Does it conceptually and operationally work? And you know, so what you end up with is a better proposition in the first place. And you also end up with, I think, much better ownership of colleagues that at the end of a process, when you say, ah, oh, we're implementing X, they go, yeah, OK, great. I mean, it, rather than it being management sort of telling people what's going on, they feel like they've got some stake in the organisation. That's what I'm trying to do. See when the staff survey comes out in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, we've got a lot of hands up and we're coming towards the end. Let me just wow. try and squeeze in really quickly. People have got two short questions um, in the front here. And I'm, I'm, thank you. You were, you were first, and apologies. Uh, Richard Johnson from Civil Service World. Just to follow up on the point you made about the death threats, which is kind of yeah. a pretty shocking indictment of, of where we are. I mean, when, when you kind of consider the work you do across the profession, if that's the political environment we're in, how do you encourage people to come forward if that's what they might face? Will that put off well, people doing the type of jobs that you've done and the type of truth to power that you do? But you have to do it, don't you? I, mean, it's a, I didn't anticipate that that was what happened. Right? I mean, it's sort of, you're in a moment. You know you're in a moment because, you know, the, the questions are very powerful one and the answer's very stark, isn't it? And, you know, first I knew that it was significant was when, when my 28-year-old son texted me with, you're trending on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> oh, is that a good thing or what? I don't know. Yeah. Right? And, but you didn't, I didn't realise it would result in that. I mean, I, it's like really, really incumbent. I think it's absolutely incumbent on us to stick to the fundamental principles of civil service, which is to give ministers the, advi the best advice that we've got, and then it's a democracy in which they make their decisions. That's the, where we are. Now, if what we're going to do is back away from that, uh, for whatever reason, I just don't, don't think that's right. It would, for me, that's about personal integrity, and you, you've got to be able to do it. And sometimes it's really, really difficult, and it's tough with ministers, but it's the right thing to do, in my opinion. Great. I think the fact that I did it, Actually, I mean, for colleagues in HMRC, believe it or not, if I'm on a select committee, they they sit around and watch it, and then they give me feedback, <laughs> which I want to encourage them to do, right? <laughs> because it's sort of that sort of organisation. But it's uh, it, I didn't realise that it adds so much resonance in the organisation that people are like, yeah, well, that's, there's the boss, you know, telling it like it is, because we sort of know that that's true. So he's sort of given that information, and you know, ministers add that information too. Awesome. Charles Tilly. Uh, John, um, I've just stood down as chairing PwC's Building Public Trust Reporting Awards over the last 10 years and reflecting on what's happened in the 10 years, um, I think the thing which uh, I found most unfortunate was that none of the big spending departments got nominated for those award awards over that time. And it feels to me really important that the, those departments are actually ex explaining they've got the money, what are they doing, what are the yep. outcomes that they're focusing upon. And the evidence base is undoubted that good reporting drives integrated, and I think you talked about cohesive evidence-based decision-making. Yep. It also motivates stakeholders, and you've talked about employees, other stakeholders, customers, and so forth. So, well, the stories that you've been talking about are great. So, you know, with your operational del delivery hat on, it seems to me that uh, really focusing on that area uh, is an important issue. And I just wondered what your views were. So I, I agree with that. I mean, I also think it's really important for the civil service to set out its stall about what it's doing. Look, we, we, we don't get everything right. We know that we don't. But we also do some fantastic things in really challenging circumstances with customers in a particular life events, right? And we don't... We don't necessarily shout about that. We don't necessarily celebrate as much. We should do, shouldn't we? You know, because we're actually doing some really rather good things. And I, I'm, my take on it is on balance, we do more good things well than we do things not so well. And we have to absolutely learn from those things that don't go so well and, you know, which get into the media and all of that. We definitely need to do that. But there's many good things that happen up down this country and maybe we're not uh, celebrating that enough. Maybe we're not telling those stories uh, well enough. I think the civil service has got more confidence uh, now, as an institution, HMRC, I think in the latest index was 
up 5% in terms of people's trust in us as an organisation. But I also know that you could e easily lose that trust if, if we do, you know, some, make some horrible mistake uh, and so on. So, but, but continuing to set out in public a positive story about great work done by civil servants up and down the country, I think, is incumbent on leaders like me um, and others, and I'm very grateful to do it. On that note, we're sadly going to have to stop. There's quite a few hands still up, and apologies to the people I, I couldn't get in. Um, many thanks, first of all, to Nick and his team at, at, at Oracle for working with us on this. Nick mentioned at the beginning that we are going to have other conversations on this, and indeed, 1st of November is Mike Driver, head of the finance profession, Rupert McNeil, to follow later in November, the exact date and time to be confirmed. Um, also, just advance notice of other events. We're talking about tax uh, and other things with Paul Collier, uh, the Economist this afternoon, this evening uh, at six o'clock um, uh, on his book, The Future of Capitalism. Uh, spoiler alert, he thinks there is one, but, um, and tax actually features in that. And then tomorrow morning, as I said, our launch of our annual document, a performance tracker, which looks at money into the public services and what comes out. And that focuses uh, in a, in more than ever before um, on, uh, on uh, the depth of, of, of you know, actually what, what is happening to performance um, in public services, nine different services, including a lot on local government. Uh, please do say if you want to come to that, uh, tell one of the IFG team on the way out if you'd like to sign up for that. But with that, just remains for me to thank John Johnson.